It is my privilege this morning to introduce Dr. Sum Lee to you all, who I know many of you um, know and have worked with. Um, Dr. Lee is one of our professors emeritus of medicine. Um, he, his background is storied and has taken him to various locations across the globe. Um, he began his training in Hong Kong. He obtained a uh, Bachelor's of Science in Medicine, which is the equivalent of RMD, um, at the University of Hong Kong, where he also stayed to complete his internal medicine postgraduate training. Um, he went on to complete a fellowship, or the equivalent of a fellowship in gastroenterology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where he also obtained his PhD in biochemistry and cellular biology. Um, he then began his faculty career as the director, excuse me, he um, then actually did a Fogarty, so he went on to do sort of postdoc PhD work as a Fogarty scholar at Harvard um, before beginning his faculty career as the director of GI research at University of Auckland. Um, he moved to the University of Washington um, after some years at Auckland, um, in New Zealand and also traveling intermittently as a visiting professor to the United States. He moved here uh, to work at the VA uh, to our benefit and actually ultimately served as the section chief of GI for 18 years at the VA um, before he was drawn back to Hong Kong in 2008. Um, well, actually, before I focus on that, I should mention he's had an incredibly prolific research career that impressively spans the spectrum from uh, bench work to translational to clinical and epidemiological research. So for those of you who say it, it, it's impossible to do it all, it is theoretically can be done um, by the grades. Um, and then he was uh, drawn away from UW in 2008 when Hong Kong asked him, the University of Hong Kong asked him to come back and serve as the Dean of Medicine there. Um, and I really want to focus on his time there because he uh, was instrumental in essentially overhauling the medical education system at the university there. Um, he concurrently served on the board of directors of the Clinical Trials Center, um, but really focused on sweeping changes in the curricular reform there. He created a center of humanities and medicine. He created a center for medical ed ethics and law. He created an institute for medical and health sciences education. He also concurrently restructured the university's research, uh, approach to research, and focused on creating interdisciplinary um, research relationships and really fostering uh, connections both between specialties and between different types of research from translational to bench work, et cetera. Um, he also created a brand new teaching hospital, as if that wasn't enough, um, to model the integration of our kind of westernized system of teaching and patient care with traditional Eastern uh, cultural values um, that has served as a really a model for the integrating care over there and for really pushing the standards of what it means to teach and practice uh, modern medicine in the country there. Um, and then has moved back here to Washington. Um, and now is able to talk to us today. He's written a lot on this as well, um, as well as lived it and practiced it and really pushed the boundaries of, of what he's going to talk to us about today. And that is um, sort of a look at medicine in the East and integrating uh, the values of Eastern and Western practice. Welcome, Dr. Lee. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be back and be accepted back to the family. Uh, I borrowed the topic of wither medicine from Leonard Bernstein, who became the Norton Professor of Music in Harvard. And he started to deliver the Norton lectures, and he used wither music as his topic. Because the 20th century musicians were baffled, they were confused, there was a change in tonality with uh, uh, new music, change in new rhythm and tempo, and John Cage disrupted it all with silence. So the musicians were confused and asked the question, where is music going? Where is the future of music? And the same, I think all of us here can reflect and think about the evolution of medicine. Where is medicine going? Is there a great future? So I used my five and a half years in Hong Kong as a look back to the East. And this lecture or this talk is totally personal. And the disclaimer that I have is it does not reflect the opinion of this institution, nor of the University of Hong Kong, nor of the government of Hong Kong, but more importantly, nor of 
the government in Beijing. <laughs> okay, so to ask whether medicine is to ask whence medicine, and to start, I would go back to the days where medicine was almost like black magic. And everything was determined by what the supernatural would say. So it then evolves to be the arbitrary oriental medicine, where they, with ob observations, really very careful, meticulous observations, derived conclusions. And the principles and theories of medicine in the ancient traditional style was a rationalization of their observations. So the pathways, the organs that are described are not what you are used to. But the evidence-based medicine, as we know, came from the anatomists. The anatomists told us, gosh, if we know the size and shape and the structure of our organs, we will understand medicine. We will understand disease. We learned a great deal, but still a great deal to learn. And then the physiologists came, William Harvey, Claude Bernard, and they say, if we understood how our organs function, then we will understand disease and cure them all. So the gastroenterologists were measuring gastric acid secretion, and the cardiologists were measuring cardiac output and the Starling's law, and the pulmonologists were measuring how you blow your FEV1. We learn a great deal, but disease still bother us. And then the biochemists came, and they say if you can understand and isolate the enzyme which causes the defect, you would be able to stamp out all diseases. We learn a great deal, the inborn disorders of metabolism, we have specific enzyme issues that are being identified and solved, but we still have a great deal to learn. And then, of course, came these cytokines and the gene, the genome. And people believe that if you can decode the gene, you will cure disease. And now, of course, it progresses to you can clip the gene with CRISPR, you can ligate it, gene editing, and even with artificial intelligence. Where is medicine leading us? So the personal journey started when I was born off an island off the southern coast of China, spent my early childhood in China. My mother took me and my sisters, and we escaped from the communists to Hong Kong. That was a terrible trip. I still have to repress my memory of that traumatic trip. Anyhow, I grew up in Hong Kong, and my ambition as a boy growing up in Hong Kong was to eat a meal and not to feel hungry after that meal. I got into medical school and then worked there and then went to New Zealand. I became a gastroenterologist. I wanted to do research, but finding that I was terribly ignorant with basic sciences, I quit my job as a gastroenterologist, went back to the lab and did a PhD, after which, I had used this as my base. I had worked in Australia, back here. I had worked in London and back here. I had worked in Boston and back here. And I came to Seattle in 1985, but never left until 2008, when in Hong Kong, the university had a big problem and I would not expound on that problem. I was asked to go back and solve it. And I said, I will spend the next five years of my life dealing this. I will have one single term. I will not get reelected. So I am going to be there and pleasing no one, do what is right. So let me talk about the things that we do. 
in the classical Flexonian way, each of you and me, we have three missions, right? We have to pass on the science and arts of medicine to the younger generations. And that is terribly important. And that is to teach. We have to explore biological truth. That drive unfolds inexorably on with all of us. And to do research is also in our blood. But my calling in my life is also to take care of the sick. So the three things to teach, to research, and to do patient care will be the topics of this talk. And I will try to round it up. <clears throat> so for those people who have not visited Hong Kong, may regard Hong Kong still has a fishing village. It was about a hundred years ago, a deserted forlorn fishing village. But now Hong Kong is the number three financial center in the world after New York and London. It is very modern. People are very sophisticated. Real estate is extremely high, much higher than downtown Seattle. Make that times 100. OK, so this is the university there. The university medical school right now this year is celebrating is 130 years history. So it is not a new school. It is a very nice building on top of a slope. And you can see the ocean downstairs. The time in Hong Kong, I think, is, is problematic. Lots of research space for those people who are interested in, in research space. The history in Hong Kong, I don't know how much do you know, um, fake news or not. <laughs> Hong Kong was conceded to the UK about 120 years ago after a war known as the Opium War. The United Kingdom at that stage had two major companies dominating the world. One is the Hudson Bay Company up in Canada. The other is the East Indian Company. The East Indian Company manufactured tea leaves to England, but also got all the gold and silver and China from China back to England in exchange for opium which they planted in India. So the Chinese said, I don't want your opium. We actually, if you put opium here, we will burn them. And a Chinese admiral did burn a shipment of British opium. Whereupon England and eight European countries, including the United States, invaded China and defeated China and had them sign the Treaty of Nanjing. And China has always seen that as a national humility. And with that treaty, Hong Kong was conceded to England for a hundred years. And the year 1997 was the year that China took back the sovereignty in Hong Kong. And now, People do not remember this state-sponsored opium in, intake. It is, so China is very adamant that Hong Kong is part of China and the islands surrounding China, including Taiwan and the nearby islands were legitimately Chinese. So that explains currently why the islands in the Southern China Sea are so inflammatory to a lot of people. But in China, the geopolitics is Hong Kong is the portal of entry of the West to China. And the system is such that Hong Kong would be allowed to be autonomous and independent for another 50 years. That was what M Margaret Thatcher and the Chinese premier had agreed on. And this creates a sense of uncertainty, this 
sense of who do I belong? I, am I a Hong Konger or am I a Chinese? Who should I be? Who should I be faithful to? So the Hong Kong people are undergoing a lot of difficult psychopathologic uh, um, visits because of that. So all these elements are brewing a perfect storm in Hong Kong. There's been unprecedented technological breakthroughs. You, you know, when I started to learn medicine, I copied down what the professor said. Right now, with a click of a mouse, I can download hundreds of paper that I cannot finish for the rest of the year. So the information explosion, the computers in Hong Kong and China are just fabulous. They are calculating not to megabyte, not to gigabyte, but terabytes per second. It is really frightening. They have gene sequencing machines that can sequence a gene within an hour. It is quite amazing. So the culture has changed. The attitude of the public before many years ago, the doctor used to be an authoritarian figure, very paternalistic. This is what you need, Tom Martin, and you will do it. But right now, the culture has changed. There is much doctor bashing. So the public actually complains about the doctor. Sometimes most of these are really unfair accusations. And the economy, as, as I said, the people in Hong Kong are very affluent. Um, in this country, we have a budget deficit, right? And we are always saying, gosh, we should let reduce the deficit. Those of you who visit Hong Kong would know that for every year, there's the budget surplus. They have so much money, they don't know what to do. So instead of giving more money to education or to the police force or, or to um, PR, they say everyone in Hong Kong who is over 18 will have $6,000 this year because we don't know what to do with the money. So you take your ID, you go to any bank, and you draw $6,000 because that would be what the budget surplus for that year is. But the economy is also fickle. With the SARS epidemic, the, the economy really dropped down. With the, the uh, economic crisis, the tsunami, the economy also dropped down. So people were really weary of, and when I went back to Hong Kong, the entire population, including the one coming home, had a sense of uncertainty and urgency. To show you what the students did, the students protested, and they wanted Hong Kong to have totally free elections, they say. And they went to the streets, they were very energetic, they were adamant, and they were vocal, and they tired out the police force. <laughs> As you see, they actually made it to the time. Okay, let me talk about teaching, because I feel that this is perhaps the most important thing that we do in a medical school. Most of us, being a faculty member, we pursue our own careers, whether it is in, in research, in patient care. We want to make ourselves a really expert in, in hepatitis, uh, an expert in, in pulmonary disease. We do so by doing research and seeing patients. But teaching is such a noble element of what we do and often ignored, under-recognized. So it is important, in my opinion, to make sure that the students understand a big dose of humanities. In the British system, it's very interesting. You enter medical school straight from high school. You don't have your first degree. And medical school in this system is six years. And I just was flabbergasted. I missed 
poetry. I missed my Shakespeare. I missed my history, my journalism. So I insisted all the students in the first two years will do 25% of humanities and ethics. So I founded the Center for Medicine and Humanities and the Center for Medical Ethics and Law. And these two are platforms for the scholars to debate, to generate new information, and also to help the curriculum to teach our students. I have a common core that they participate in. I offer this common core to non-medical students. I say to the Senate and the Council, the university is a place to have education. It is not a vocational training factory. We don't take young minds in and manufacture engineers and accountants and, and, and lawyers. We have to give them a good education. And even if they're not medical students, I told them they can study cancer. They can study public health. They can study immunity. They can study sex and sexuality from faculties at the medical school will go and teach these non-medical students. And I have, because of the big package of headache that I carry, and you will understand why I was able to implement multi-inter-transdisciplinary education. That is the nurses and the doctors and the pharmacists, they all get together and study anatomy, physiology and biology for a little while. And I insisted that the Chinese medicine students, the stu medical students for the School of Chinese Medicine also must study anatomy. And I insisted that our School of Pharmacy students must also study herbal medicine because they live in a world they need to understand what the other people are talking about. And of course, there is early clinical contact, even with the first year medical students, I would have them pair up with a, a pregnant woman so that he or she can follow that woman until delivery and, and the student writes a report. I can have them pair up with someone uh, at a hospice and until the patient dies. And the student then observes the evolution of human affairs and human emotion. What drugs were they taking? So they don't have to know how to do surgery and things like that before they understand a dose of humanity. So the, when I first came to Hong Kong, I thought I was just taking care of the medical school. Little did I know that my headache was much bigger. So I took care of the School of Medicine and the School of Nursing. The nursing school was much bigger than the medical school. And the School of Public Health and the School of Pharmacology and Pharmacy. And interesting enough, really interesting and challenging to me was the School of Chinese Medicine, of which I knew virtually nothing. But I was totally fascinated by that. I remember when I was a little kid, I was taken by my mother to see an herbalist. And the herbalist asked me to open my mouth and stick out my tongue. And he took a look at it and say, ha, ah, kid, you have this. And I then had to drink many cups of really bitter herbal preparation. So I remember the Chinese medicine well. And I went back to the school and challenged the senior professors. What was that herbalist doing to me? <laughs> so when I was dean of medicine, I gave up all my research. It was painful. I gave up all my clinical contact, which was painful. I was also a doctor. Let me tell you, something about that a little later. But the, the element or the component that I did not give up was teaching. 
And that surprised all my colleagues in Hong Kong. They say, gosh, we actually want to get away from teaching. And you, as dean, you want to teach? I said, you bet. So every year, I welcomed the new students, and I took a small group in, in, in problem uh, um, learning. So problem-based learning allowed me to have a small group each year. And every year throughout the five years, I will meet with them and ask of their progress. It's almost like a hepatologist doing a serial biopsy of a liver and see how, how the disease progresses. So um, my students were really very intelligent and fine young men and women, and I love the teaching there. But I think as a school, as a school, our responsibilities would not end when they get a piece of paper or they march across the stage and graduate. I think our responsibilities go beyond that. We need to see that these young men and women will evolve as wonderful physicians. And I have a young clinical scholars program which can retain them to work with the teaching hospital for a number of years. If they want to go to international training, there is also a funded program. So it's an in-house program to nurture our graduates because I think when they are new and green, when they are wild eyes, they still need some hand-holding before they can find their bliss. So this is a program that I instigated, which has really blossomed into retaining now more than 100 young faculty. The leadership training program, and, and again, the affiliate teaching hospitals is something really interesting. I think that's going to be the most interesting topic of this talk. We need a little bit of comic relief here before I plunge into more serious stuff. My name caused some confusion. So you, you guys call me Sum, which is correct, but my name is actually Li Sum Ping. Um, Li is the family name which we put first. Sum in Chinese means heart or the mind, and Ping means peace. So I'm peace of the mind of the family of Li. This can be as when I went overseas, turn around as Sam Ping Li. You guys call me Sam P Li or S P Li. And when I went back, you guys and some people call me Sam and Shum and Zoom. Some of you call me Sam. And because of the S P Li, I was called Dr. Splee and Dr. Sleep. But the interesting thing in Cantonese is they use an R as an added slang. So I was called Asam and also called Adin. Dean in Chinese means crazy. So I'm the crazy one. In any case, with research, I knew that I had very little time to make an impact. The Chinese are very intelligent. They're very clever people and very industrious people. But one thing is they are very selfish and self-centered. So if you look at Hong Kong and the research done in Hong Kong, they are fragmented into fiefdoms. The postdocs are not allowed to talk to other postdocs. You actually lock your, your lab every, every evening as you leave. There wasn't a real communication and collaboration. And I was terribly annoyed with that. And I was adamant that all these barriers must be broken before Hong Kong or before China can, can reach any greatness. So with the research, basically I broke down the barriers and created core facilities. Interesting enough for most of you, here, budgetary concerns are limiting factors. 
But the amount of funds in Hong Kong and in China, they're so flexible and they're so abundant, it, it blew my mind. That is, if Dr. Bremner goes to see a person, and this may be the dean or maybe a, a donor, and says, I have a program. This program is going to enhance our research or enhance our patient care. And he doesn't have to write a book or a, a grant, but if he can convince and persuade that person, they give him an open check and, and he can fill in as many zeros as he likes. It's actually quite an interesting uh, system. Okay. So I created core facilities and, and biorepositories and bioinformatics and data bank, um, genomic sciences. We created a stem cell facilities where in Hong Kong, would you believe it? We can have GMC manufacture of human stem cells in Hong Kong within three years that I was there. And in the US, I think there's only two facilities that can do that. And we, can ha we have a structural biology and molecular design that would allow us to synthesize proteins. And because of the synchrotrons so easily available, uh, just about 40 miles from us is the largest synchrotron in the world. We have a surplus of X-ray fields that we can do crystallography within a day with high resolution. We have a drug discovery uh, unit that would allow us to have phase one trial of any new compound on Homo sapiens. And we have a clinical trial unit which would allow us to do double blind randomized control trials. All these are built in within five years. And mind you, this clinical trial unit is FDA approved. It is the only unit that FDA approves outside of the US. We have synthetic biology creating new genes. We have gene editing, which we use CRISPR and ligation. But I have these new technologies under the direction and oversight of the medical ethics unit. I am very paranoid uh, about technology going beyond the ethical confines. It is acceptable for, for you, for anyone, to do something which is legally acceptable, but ethically not acceptable. So with the experiments and the things that we were doing, I have to be uh, supervised by ethics. I built a cyclotron and having no space, uh, I emptied the, th the, sub the third sub-basement for parking and installed a cyclotron. And now at Hong Kong University, we can synthesize our own isotopes, unstable isotopes, to do functional MRI, but also for research to label cells to follow their fate, their growth and differentiation and all these again within a, a few years. Now, Chinese medicine. So I challenged the faculty in the School of Chinese Medicine, and I say, if Chinese medicine truly works, I want to understand why. I want to understand the structure, the function, the cell physiology, and how it affects human genes. So we set up the Molecular Chinese Medicine Research Center. We complete with mass specs and gene arrays. So you can throw in a purified herbal system and you can in human cells, in animals, see what genes are expressed, what genes are suppressed. And I have them doing double blind control trials in therapeutics. And I even challenged them with diagnostics. So I went back to my tongue. 
I said, I said to the Chinese doctors, can you really diagnose disease by looking at the tongue? And he said, yes, we can. I said, okay. So I took digitized photographs of 500 tongues <laughs> of normal subjects, 500 tongues of varying diagnosis by Western doctors. And then I randomized them. And I had 50 Chinese medical practitioners look at these tongues in a blinded but controlled way. I even tried to trick them. I have the same tongues being shown to them again, a second time, a third time. I was trying to work out the inter-observer error and the intra-observer error to challenge them. Is it real that you can diagnose a disease, kidney or digestive disease, by looking? So in diagnostics and therapeutics, and in the new hospitals that we built, and you will hear about that in the next 10 minutes, I integrated the clinical approach with Western medicine and also traditional Chinese medicine practitioners side by side. They compare notes. So they manage patients in a conjoint manner, in a collaborative manner. For those of you who had visited Hong Kong or Hong Kong University, you would have visited the Queen Mary Hospital. So British, Queen Mary. There is um, another medical school in, in Hong Kong, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and their hospital is, of course, the Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, the Prince of Wales Hospital is a very well-equipped and, and well-built hospital, much newer. This was from antiquity. So I will talk about that. This was not our teaching hospital. It's a government hospital. The university, the medical school, has only a very small attachment to that hospital. So I, again, persuaded the government to allow the medical school to have a much better representation and ownership of this hospital. So let's look at that. If you recall where the medical school was, it's a little down of this slope. So the hospital is on the top of the hill and this is the overpass. And this is the design of the new addition to the old antiquated hospital. And this is what it will be after fully built. <clears throat> so let's get to the Hong Kong Yu Shenzhen Hospital. I went to Hong Kong in 2008 uh, and reported to duty in, in August. By around December, the Minister of Health of China visited me and congratulated, congratulated my appointment. And I actually, for the first half hour, didn't understand what the message was. But eventually, it came out pretty loud and clear. And the Chinese officials, there were a whole host of them, explained to me that China is doing great. Our economy is great, they say. Our building is great. Our uh, ability to manufacture is great. Our ability to do electronics, no one will surpass us. But our healthcare is awful. It's terrible. It is difficult to access a good doctor. It is difficult to pay for a good doctor. It is so difficult to control the quality of doctors. We have no way of doing that. And we have consulted with the Australians. There was a group of Australians who we have worked with. There was a group of Americans from the Mayo Clinic that we have worked with to try and improve the healthcare system in China. But we don't think they would work. We cannot transplant these foreign concepts on Chinese soil. 
they don't understand the sensitivities of our values. They just disrupted everything and made recommendations, oblivious of what we believe to be important and sacrosanct. And besides, and I didn't know this until I went back to China, you know, having these people advise us is kind of losing face, isn't it? And losing face in China is very important. So I, I asked them point blank, why are you talking to me? And they said, listen some more. In Hong Kong, we like what you're doing, Professor Lee. In Hong Kong, you have the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. You have the lowest maternity mortality rate in the world. You have the highest life expectancy of males in the world. And in five years, you will surpass Japan to have the highest life expectancy in females in the entire world. And you, Professor Lee, operates with a GDP of under 6%. And Hong Kong U, the second year I was there, was ranked the number one university in the entire of Asia. And he said, we want to copy the way you do healthcare. For example, you are managing a group of Hyatt hotels and you are doing well. Your customers say that you are great and your operating cost is low. We will build the best Hyatt hotel in China, in Shenzhen. Can you help me to manage the hotel? If your management style is good, we will copy that to be throughout China. And Shenzhen is a town, it's a city, only about 30 miles north of Hong Kong, driving distance. <coughs> about 60 years ago, Deng Xiaoping, a, a Chinese communist leader, appointed Shenzhen as a pilot site for economic reform. And in 60 years, the economy of China really took flight. And China now says, we also appoint Shenzhen as the pilot experiment of our healthcare reform. So Professor Li, we will build you a hospital in Shenzhen. And will you and your university staff come and help us operate this hospital? It will be to your design and everything you ask. And he attempted to flatter me, which didn't go down well, but I will repeat this to you. He said, you know what? We have done some research on you. I said, what? I don't have any criminal records, I said. They say, no, but you know Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who is the founding father of modern China. Dr. Sun was the man who led the revolution against the former Qing dynasty and overthrew the last emperor and became new China. And Dr. Sun was a graduate of Hong Kong University Medicine. And Dr. Sun went to the US, returned back to Hong Kong, and then organized the revolution. And he said, history should repeat itself and you should do this great thing for your motherland. So I said, it's not the same. <laughs> Nonetheless, when I visited the land, it was a, just a big piece of land. But the next three months when I visited, the cranes were there. The constructions were so fast and of a scale that will blow your mind off. This, this plot is greater than Bellevue Square and Lincoln Square added together. And within a year, the hospital was built. This is the hospital. It has 3,000 beds. 3,000. The 
daily visit to the outpatient department is 15,000. We have 46 operating rooms, 50 CT scans, and 50 MRIs. <laughs> the pharmacy uses a robot to dispense medicine and can dispense 50,000 prescriptions in a day, all automatically plaster wrapped with no human error. It delivers to each ward to the outpatient department and is picked up with IDs of infrared scans. Every patient coming into the hospital before they enter, their iPhone would have beeped and say, we found you, your appointment is here, and you are directed to a room and you would be told that you, your waiting time is 3.5 minutes. You can dial up and get an appointment through an iPhone. You're paid through the iPhone. The hospital is, is superb, but the operating proceedings and the, the process and procedures are JCOH. Well, we use an Australian system. It is internationally accredited. And this is so very rare for the hospitals in, in China. So we are doing this to international standards. You know, the Chinese are very good with, with their hands. Um, they prescribed a lot. Um, they, they do a lot of operations. For example, in Hong Kong, we have about 90 renal transplants a year. But in a single hospital in China, they can do 9,000 renal transplants per year. That is, we cannot teach them how to do the incisions and sewing. They are technically very good. But what we can teach them is the ethics. You don't transplant patients using organs obtained from a dubious source. So the ethics and the procedure of those things are the important things that we made an impact on the Chinese. We say within this hospital, there is no smoking and the surgeons really got mad. <laughs> we say there should be no red packets. These are bribery and everybody got mad. But we said, having I employed someone who just um, retired at the age of 60, managing um, the financial affairs for the national health system in the UK to help me. We employ people with a salary of 3.5 those of the outside community. But the requirement is you cannot and you will not take bribes. You are fired summarily without recourse if you're caught. So that was the system. And medicine here is practiced as evidence-based, as you and I know, not as you, you look a bit yellow, um, Mr. Martin, we will give you 12 drugs to take, right? So we, we have to do this evidence-based medicine. So this if it works, would revolutionize what China wants to do. It's not only I say so. Science visited the place and, and wrote it up and with the title of the world's biggest healthcare system goes under the knife. And there was a picture of yours truly in the magazine of science. I, I thought I would never make it to any magazine uh, except some, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the Wall Street Journal said um, in, in 1915, that this hospital is an experiment and, and Wall Street Journal is correct. It is an experiment that may have important ramifications. So. 
The Glen Eagles is another hospital in Hong Kong that I um, won the bid to build. And the reason that I did so was in Hong Kong, a lot of very rich people, they monopolize the private sector, the private care. Again, people who do a colonoscopy in a private care can charge a million dollars. Would you believe that? And people pay. That's the problem. So we have a gap of the high and very high unreachable end of private care and this public care, which is good, but the waiting time is long. So I said we must copy what the U.S. has, that the medical faculty should take ownership of patient care and make sure that patient care is accessible. So I built this hospital so that we can charge what the insurance company would pay, and yet the patients can come and we can expand our research base, we can expand our patient care base. So we won the bid and this hospital has just been completed last year, it's, it's now functional. It's merely a 500 bed hospital, but within it, uh, mental care, I insisted that should be inpatient mental care. I think this is something that we have really unfortunately uh, <laughs> passed on the responsibility uh, of not taking care of our mental, mental patients. And there is also integrated Chinese and Western medicine in this hospital. Okay. Okay. I convinced the council and the Senate that there is no financial risk to us, clinical governance, we can ensure these things and we will be stronger and richer because of that. Time's up. Um, so what do I think? L looking back to the East, and coming back home now to Seattle. Would I want to make a comparison? It's so dangerous to make any comparison, but let me try. I think for medical education, I still like what we have here. Primarily, our students are much more mature. In Hong Kong, I take in the students and they're <laughs> merely 15, 16 years old. It's very difficult to talk to these youngsters and convince them of human suffering. I don't think they truly understand. And also, the Chinese students are much more submissive. They don't challenge me as a, a professor. I tell them what to do and they do it dutifully. The students here would say, hey, Sam, I don't think you're right. <laughs> huh? In research, I think the East is catching up fast with research, not only with the hardwares, but the criticism of the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans are they are very good in reproducing what the West has invented, but they lack creativity, they lack innovation. I don't think that is true anymore. If you look at all the patent applications, you look at the first-rate journals um, with basic science, they come from the East. And patient care, as I said, we do quite well with patient care. And how come in our great country here that we spend more than 17% of our GDP in patient care, and yet our ranking is so low and our patient satisfaction is so low. Where are the lesions? Well, um, the cost is the administrative cost, which is humongous. Uh, a hospital employs 19,000 staff just to code and report and negotiate with the insurance company. Would you believe that? The drug cost, if you travel to 
to Hong Kong, the same drug manufactured by a company in the U.S. Dr. Tom Martin sells for a fraction of the price in Asia compared with Hong Kong. Why? Why have we allowed this to happen in this country? Defensive medicine, excessive treatment, the hype we receive through TV make us believe that more toxic, more expensive treatment is better care. Is it really? Um, and our doctor-patient relationship, we, we say patient-centered and patient decision. Is the patient truly well-informed enough to make the right decision? Um, so there are many cultural and society attitudes, which I think are barriers for us here in the West to really become um, a cost effective and yet a leader of innovation. There are issues that are totally solvable. And I look at the younger people within this audience, and I think the challenge should be met by you. Retiring. This is the NIH Chim. When he got retired, uh, I didn't like this picture. I think he's really worn out, you, you know, with those lethargic eyes, sort of not focusing anywhere, but looking wantonly into, into the void. I thought Retiring is to be young and aggressive and free, but it's not like that. I think to retire is to become more reflective and have time to enjoy. And uh, uh, I say this to Bill Bremner, uh, there is much hope after retirement. And you can do that, like myself, in a graduated way. Uh, I am back in Seattle in this medical school, and I am doing part-time for GI and enjoying that tremendously. So, um, East and West, in my opinion, if I would make a bold hypothesis. I hope with us, we would break down barriers, we will solve issues, we will examine truth unambiguously, and at some stage, I hope there is no East medicine and West medicine. There is only one medicine, which is good medicine. And of course, the science and the art, the journey and the destination, it is not the destination that would make you great, it is the traveling. It is the traveling which is much more interesting. It is the traveling that will transform you and the destination and the individual and the community and the beginning and the end. I will end this by returning to our initial questions, just like a symphony, you know, the, the the final notes would echo the opening bar of the music and finds its original motif and come back to the home key. And the question is, is there hope for medicine? Where is medicine going? And I unequivocally and emphatically will tell you that the best of medicine is yet to come. We will do well. This is very exciting times. We have seen the good things, the not so good things, but the human spirit will triumph. The best is yet to come. It, it has always been so, and it must be so. Thank you.